Okay, so site selection. I have just one word chart. I know these are horrible. But, <laughs> but there's two parts to landing site selection. One is it's got to be interesting, and it's got to be tailored to the science objectives of the mission. And the second is it has to be safe, because it doesn't matter what dancing vision the scientists think they're going to have about what they're going to get when they get there. If it doesn't land safely, you get no science. Bad deal. <laughs> <laughs> The so site must address the basic science objectives of the mission, and that's an astrobiologically relevant environment. Was it wet? Was it habitable? And could it preserve any biosignatures that might have formed? Could you preserve that in a geologic record? Imagine a stratigraphy of different rocks that could have been in habitable environments, and you'd know that the rocks at the bottom were older than the rocks on top. And so now you have some known arrangement of these rocks. And it turns out that igneous rocks that form by a primary mantle melt from the mantle, just like our volcanoes do here on Earth, carry a signature of the stuff that they came from. And the mantle is the biggest reservoir in a planet. And so by getting and bringing back those rocks, you can learn about the internal dynamics and how long the planet stayed hot and warm and so on. In order to do site selection, you have to do it as they build the spacecraft. You say, well, why is that? Because no matter what they think they're going to build, there are always things that happen during construction of the spacecraft that change it just a little bit. And if they change it enough, the place that you thought was going to be safe may not be safe when you get to the end. So you have to do site selection during the time that you build it. And for a scientist, I'm a, I'm a geologist, and by the way, I really appreciate astronomers wanting to hear a geologist. I think that's totally cool. <laughs> so, but I have to talk to a lot of engineers. Engineers are not like scientists, okay? Scientists ask, why? Why did this get to be this way? Engineers ask, how? How do you build this thing? But you've got to work together to get this spacecraft to Mars and to land. OK, so here is Mars. Uh, the colors on this map are the topography. Uh, blue's low, red's high. So first off, we can all be geologists for an instant. Uh, and I'll give you the two-minute geologic history of Mars. The southern highlands are all high in elevation. And there's lots and lots of craters, pockmarked with craters. They're side to side. Well, the longer a surface has been there, the more craters it gets. So this surface is really, really old. Okay? However, the northern hemisphere is low, five kilometers lower. And what else? Well, there's very few craters. So that surface is young. So first off, something happened very early in Mars's history, and it lowered the northern third of the planet and got rid of all that material somewhere and uh, left a highlands that was heavily cratered to the south. Uh, what do we think that was? Actually, an oblique giant impact, not unlike the kind of impact that probably spun the moon off from the Earth in the very early period. Second geologic event, you'll notice that there's this big red area that's super high. And it has four of the largest volcanoes in the solar system. How's that? This is probably the biggest, as big as the state of Texas. It rises 22 kilometers above the datum it started at. That's 10 times higher than Mount Everest, something like that. And then Valles Marineris, which is a rift or a, a fault that goes radially away from this structure. This is a giant load on the surface of the planet, and it probably formed very early, and it probably had a lot to do with the early climate on Mars. OK, so big geology right there. And what's shown in white are the existing safe, uh, sorry, safe because the spacecraft survived when they landed. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, from start, it's Viking 1, Viking Lander 2, uh, Pathfinder, uh, let's see, Spirit, Opportunity, Phoenix, and Curiosity. Look, I did that all from memory. <laughs> Actually, it turned out I was involved in just about all of those, except for the Vikings, so it wasn't too hard to remember them. So, so what do you see here? 
So where are all the landers? Lowlands. So why is that? Well, the reason is that somebody knows the answer to that too. More atmosphere, that's right. So the atmosphere on Mars is about 1% the atmosphere of the Earth. And so far, we've used, par we've used parachutes to slow the spacecraft down. And the more atmosphere you have and the lower in elevation you go, the thicker that atmosphere gets and the more effective your parachute is. So the second thing you notice, they all tend to be near the equator. So why is that? Right, warmer is right, and more important, if you have a solar-powered spacecraft, blurt it out, sunlight, right. So you get more insulation near the sun, near the equator. So the problem here is that Mars didn't get the engineering memo about how to cooperate with landers. <laughs> and you can see, here's the, here's the equator right there, and everything's too high. You can't, you can't land in those spots, there's not enough atmosphere. So where can you land for this spacecraft, Mars 2020? Uh, what's shown here is the same topography, slightly color-coded. We got 30 north to 30 south. That's our kind of warm temperature bounds. Anything black is above the elevation at which the parachute can slow the spacecraft well enough. And that leaves these areas that are colored in between. And then there are these white and gray blotches. And those are areas that have uh, extremely low thermal inertia and high albedo. You don't know what that means, but they're composed of <coughs> dust, fine-grained dust, one to three microns thick, that is slowly filtered out of the atmosphere and landed on the ground. And in some cases, that dust is meters to tens of meters thick. And we have encountered it at the landing sites that we have gone to, and it won't support anything. It is. The, your spacecraft would sink right through it. Not only that, if you're trying to get solar power and you got all this dust around and you sink into it and there's dust everywhere, you're not going to get much power. So we basically toss out any of these very dusty regions. So we just got rid of, so plus or minus 30 is about half of the area of the planet. And you can see more than half of that area is too high. And another whole quarter or a third is too dusty. And so now you got to deal with, you got this little slice here, and this little <laughs> slice here, and, and this little slice here, and that's it. That's what you got to work with. OK, so how do you go to find one of these great places on Mars that has this evidence for potentially biologic activity? Well. I'm not the smartest guy in the world, and nobody else is, but if you had all of those people together and you asked everyone, where would you go on Mars with this spacecraft and this payload, and where would you go to try to find a location that was wet, that could have sequestered any biologic activity that had formed there, and could have had a diversity of rocks that's there for us to go look at now? So we had a workshop, and we invited anybody. Anybody could have come. Completely open workshop. And we asked them, and they proposed 30 sites. Now, in order to determine if the site's going to be safe, we have these orbiters, and we take pictures of these sites. So if we find out about the site, we can then tell the orbiters to take high-resolution images of those sites to say, is it too rocky? Is it too slopey? Is it, what are the bad things there? So you start taking pictures as soon as you find out what those 30 are. So the first workshop occurred in May uh, 2014, and these 30 sites were suggested by the mostly scientists community, and we started taking pictures of them. And then a year and a half later, we invited everybody back. This is the uh, suite of sites at the second workshop. Uh, eight of them were down-selected from that, to look at them in greater detail. Because if you have 30, you can't study them enough to sort of narrow things down. So now we got them down to eight, and we obtained the most amazing suite of images from these sites that any, exist on Mars. High resolution images at 25 centimeters per pixel. We could identify a meter size object on the surface. We took stereo images so we could create digital elevation models, and we know what the topography was. The, the resolution was so high we could see any rock 
bigger than one and a half meters in diameter. So, so you can see the mermaid and the beer can <laughs> and all those things? And, and we could see lunch. every previous <laughs> lander that we ever sent to Mars. And in order to make sure that we measured the rocks right, we measured the shadows that were produced by those rocks. And we took the same pictures of the landers, and we know the size of those because we built them. Right. And we measured those using the shadows, and that's how we calibrated our technique to measure the rocks. Right. Very cool. <laughs> I mean, how silly is that, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, okay, so eight locations on Mars, and one of them, look at that, right in Valles Marineris. So Valles Marineris is the biggest rift in the solar system. It's 10 kilometers from the top to the bottom, and this particular site is cantilevered halfway down the escarpment, five kilometers from the top five kilometers from the bottom on this little, little thing sticking out that's big enough <laughs> that you could just barely get an ellipse in. And the engineers are going, are you sure? <laughs> There's got to be someplace better than that. <laughs> okay.